Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Tim Wilson. I'm the editor of uh, Dark Reading. We have Michelle Schaefer, who's the vice president of what's your official title? Senior vice president at Merit Group. So, which is one of the leading PR firms in, in the security space. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about security in the media. And I, I guess I should tell you that after Trey's talk that, you know, you can put your tray tables down and you're free to move about the cabin. So um, we're, um, we're going to talk a little bit about where you get your information when you're a security professional, where do you, you know, find the, the latest information, where you get what you get, whether it's reliable or not, and how do you set priorities based on the, on the information that you're getting. And we're going to talk a little bit about sort of the sausage making that goes on behind the development of the, of the news um, and how the news works so that you can factor that in to what you're reading and what you're seeing and, and whether or not you, how much credence you put in to the information that you're getting. So with that, let's get it. So um, I'll start off a little bit. Um, I'm, giving, I'm gonna give you some information, um, dark reading, uh, you guys read dark reading, you know it, and that kind of, okay, good. Um, dark reading uh, is part of the same company that, that runs Black Hat as well. So we're doing, we're in the process right now of doing a survey of Black Hat attendees, uh, past and present, uh, on a lot of different things. But one of the things that we asked them about is sort of, you know, um, what the, keeps them awake at night and where they get their information and how they make decisions and, th and that kind of stuff. So I'm going to share a little bit of data with you. Um, it's, uh, this is data that just came in. There's no report associated with it. You're, the, you're actually the first ones to hear it. So, um, but it's the same one. Uh, it's, it's a sim we did a similar study last year. So this is this year's numbers. So when we ask people, um, and again, black hat attendees, so high, high intensity security pros for the most part, you know, what are your biggest worries? So we gave them a long list of things that actually was longer than this list. Um, but the, uh, the first thing, the top uh, item on the list was phishing, social engineering, Second one was sophisticated and targeted attacks. They're the things you don't know that you don't know, right? You're, they're, you're, there's stuff going on and you have this sense that you don't know how to find it and those are the things that sort of keep you awake at night. Um, vulnerabilities introduced by in, uh, internally developed apps, you know, the kind of stuff that's you're coming out of your development teams. Data theft and sabotage by malicious insiders. It's again, you know, the things that could cause the most damage that you're least likely to know about. So not a big surprise here, but you know, if, you, if you look at things like, uh, we ask questions like, uh, you know, what's the company's risk uh, status? Uh, what, where are you with compliance? Um, Internet of Things, all ranked at the bottom. You know, these are not the things that are keeping people awake at night. But interestingly, the things that when we ask them how they spend their time or what their management is concerned about, those things ranked very high, right? So risk management, how to evaluate and come up with a risk model for, for the organization. What, what, what are the, what, where are we as a company? Um, and things like uh, um, compliance, another issue that's very high on the manager's scale, but very low on the security professional's scale. So um, lots of sort of disconnects there. When we ask security pros, where do, you, where do you get your information? You know, the latest threats, what you're gonna be working on that day, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do that day? What's, what's important? Um, they, they talked about lots of different things. Uh, security researcher blogs ended up being number one. Um, and then IT news media, so dark reading type publications, um, ranked at the top, and then conferences like this, you know, where you, where you know you're getting information from reliable sources and, and that sort of thing. And then it starts to tail off a little bit in terms of uh, reliability. You know, colleagues, 56% said, you know, I get stuff from the people I work with or people I know, vulnerability reporting sites and, and that sort of thing. 
Um, as Trey was talking about, there, you know, you get a lot of stuff from Twitter. Not always sure how reliable it is, um, and it comes in very small amounts, so you can't always process it. You know, it, you know, you, you know something happened, but you don't get, you don't have a lot of details. So that's that's sort of where they get their data from. We asked them, what do you think gets too much attention? You know, when you, when you read in the media, um, security blogger sites, you read in uh, you t what's talked about at conferences, what, you know, what's, what's, what do you get too much of? Um, so they talked about things like government su surveillance, you know, whether or not the NSA is watching us. Um, China, espionage by foreign governments, you know, the sense was, you know, we're getting too much of that stuff. Hacktivists, you know, uh, the anonymouses and, and you know, organizations like that. Interestingly, ransomware was actually ranked fairly high because some people felt like, you know, it's getting too much attention. And then we asked them, what gets too little attention? What, you know, when you, get, when, you, when you read in the media, you look at Twitter, you know, what, what are you not getting enough information about? So accidental data leaks. So the things that happen every day to you because somebody didn't follow security policy or, you know, and all of a sudden you're, you've got a compromise. Uh, phishing and those, those sorts of attacks, the social engineering stuff. Um, and then, but interestingly, we start to see some of the things that were on the list of too much, we also see as being not enough. So government surveillance, some people are really worried about, you know, how much surveillance are we getting? And some people are, um, you know, feel like they don't care. So you start to see where things begin to, it begins to depend on who you are, what's important. And that's where, uh, and that's where we are as we begin to look at, you know, what the, the media covers. So we know that what, what's important to you may not be what's important to the media. So the media is looking for stuff that's new, right? So um, if you're dealing with SQL injection or you know, buffer overflow, stuff like that, it's not very sexy from a news perspective. So then you won't find a lot of coverage about it. Um, you know, if you're um, you know, focused in on um, you know, the, the hottest and the most interesting threats, you know, medical devices, you know, cars that can be sent off the road, and drones that can be controlled, you know, those are all things that are really interesting from a security perspective, but they don't, they don't have impact on most of you because you don't have those things. You're not managing those things every day. And for a lot of these organizations, the media organizations, they're, and we're going to talk a little bit about how they work, but they're focused on what can bring the most eyeballs, but that's not necessarily what's most important to you. So you're looking at, you know, uh, some topics that are being overhyped, some, you know, big headlines, that sort of thing. We're going to talk a little bit about um, branded bugs, you know, the heart bleeds and the poodles and the, and the things that have a little logo and they have their name and, you know, they get, and people get excited about them because they're marketed really well. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how what you consider to be the most reliable sources, which by our data is, you know, security experts, media and conferences, can be influenced by lots of different factors. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how these things happen, how these things are brought to you, and so that you can have a little bit more, um, you know, sort of a filter, you know, as to what you accept and what you don't accept, uh, you know, as far as uh, new information. So one of the things that happens uh, to all of us in the media is, is that we're very affected by PR and marketing organizations who sort of put these things together, whether it's branded bugs or product messages or you know, those kinds of things. So Michelle's going to talk a little bit about how that happens. So we all read the news, right? And we all see lots of stuff out there. It's a very noisy, crowded market. Um, 
you know, there's a ton of security vendors. And, you know, when I started doing cybersecurity PR 13 years ago, there was probably really only, you know, 20, maybe 30 companies that you really knew and you heard from pretty frequently. Today, there are 1,400 plus cybersecurity vendors out there. And so that's what's creating a ton of this noise. But as a result, we're seeing that products and technologies are completely overblown. Um, it's causing a lot of confusion and a lot of false claims in the market about technologies. And you hear best in breed or, you know, industry leading first and all these claims about these technologies, but how can you really prove it? It's pretty tough unless you're really there using the product. We hear about security vulnerabilities all the time, every single day. And you know what? Maybe I'm guilty of it too. I am a PR and I'm a marketing person and I work with a lot of marketing teams and this is what we have to do. We have to get the news out there. But it's gotten to a point where there's a lot of concern and a lot of sort of um, confusion about what's real and what's not and what the goal of these vulnerabilities really is and what's really behind it from a marketing perspective. And then we're finding that new issues and threats are taking over old ones. So if you think about it, the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities, that list doesn't change. Year after year, it's the same bugs that come up. Um, these are the most important things that IT security professionals should actually be addressing. But this noise and this confusion in this very crowded market is causing a big, I would say, tornado effect. But a lot of it starts with sort of the headlines. And hot markets drive big headlines. And over the past few years, we've seen a lot of these hot, sexy markets. Think uh, endpoint security, threat intelligence, incident response. There's a lot of attention that's being given to certain sexy areas of these technologies. And a lot of that has to do with many factors. So number one, venture capital funding. We're seeing a ton of VC money that has been dumped into certain companies. And that causes sort of this overblown hype. You know, if a VC is putting $30 million into a company or $250 million, you know, that definitely draws eyeballs. That catches the media's attention, and it also catches the attention of the whole industry. You know, if somebody's being invested in, then yes, their technology is great, right? Number two, analysts and reporters, they're covering a lot of these technologies and special reports. We see it all the time. We have the Gartner Cool Vendors Report. We've got Magic Quadrants. We have the Hot Startups to Watch columns. And those are good, and they're important, and they're a great way of getting out there and getting that sort of validation in the market. But again, you know, if you think about the way the analysts work, it is, a lot of it is pay for play. Um, you know, if you are signed up with Gartner, chances are you're going to make it into the cool vendor report or the magic quadrant. You're almost guaranteed a position. So there is that pay for play aspect that you have to think about. And product coverage. It's very, very difficult to get. Like I said, 10 years ago when I started doing this, it was pretty easy to actually call up a reporter at Network World and tell him that I had a new firewall and they would write about it. And that was great because it got, you know, my client great coverage. It was all about their product and technology and how great it was. Today, reporters will not do that. It is very, very tough to get a solid piece of product coverage because, again, we're competing with 1,400 other vendors that are saying that their technology is the greatest. And reporters want to drive headlines, and they know that product coverage really isn't going to get it for them. Um, you know, that's why, as PR professionals, we take the tack these days to combine your product coverage with something else. We have to basically bring something a little bit more beefy, juicy, headline worthy to a reporter in order to get them to write. And that is what is also causing a lot of this sort of tornado effect. Um, and PR pros, they just know this, that it's sort of this magic recipe. You put together analyst validation. You get Gartner to say you're great. You get your product news, which you have to get out anyway. You get a venture capital that's funded you and you go out and promote that news. And then you couple it with this great threat report with these you know, vulnerabilities or these new threats that your company has found. And that creates the good headline. So let's talk about some major vulnerabilities that have made major headlines. And how many of you guys saw a lot of the news around bad luck earlier this year? How many of you felt that it was pretty much overhyped? <laughs> 
All right, well, you are correct. And in fact, um, when I went back and I looked at some of the articles around bad luck in particular, I saw reporters, you know, industry, you know, gurus, the CTO of Qualys, many people that basically looked at this vulnerability and said, this was all a marketing ploy. It was all over Twitter. There was definitely this sort of spiral effect about this particular vulnerability. But what it did, I think, was raised awareness to the problem that we've got today. Because, you know, I had never seen, I guess, that plethora, that amount of sort of criticism towards one of these vulnerabilities, the way bad luck was definitely negatively perceived by everyone in the industry. And after a lot of digging, what was supposed to be, you know, just a um, remote code execution bug turned out to be um, a man in the middle denial of service vulnerability, and it was all overhyped. So I think that was just probably the, the most recent worst example of the overhyped vulnerability. Looking back last year, the Carbonac gang in 2015, um, Kaspersky, you know, they have a great threat lab. They do a great job of getting great vulnerability data out there. Do it very strategically. I'm kind of going in and out. Um, so every year they have Kaspersky's Cybersecurity Analyst Summit. And at that event, which is in some wonderful place on an island, you know, Puerto Rico or the Bahamas or wherever they do it, Spain, I think, this past year, they invite security reporters and bloggers to come. And what they do is they hold on to their best, biggest, juiciest news of the year, and they release it there. And this past criticism around this Carbonac gang um, vulnerability that, that they had disclosed because they held on to the information. You guys can still hear me, right? I'm pretty loud. For 14 years, you can hear me. All right. So what we saw was that people were criticizing Kaspersky because they actually knew about a vulnerability and they held on to it for several months for marketing purposes. And, you know, to the industry, it looked a little bit like a head scratcher because you know, if you have a threat that's out there in the wild, shouldn't you disclose it properly? And shouldn't it be fixed? This vulnerability was running around for a while before anything ever actually happened. But what was also interesting is that when the news came out, FSISAC and the American Bankers Association, they actually said this wasn't news. It had been around for a while. They knew about the vulnerability. They were seeing it at some of the financial institutions and the banks. So it all sort of looked very sketchy, um, you know, once you think about it from a marketing perspective and what the industry really needed. And I think by far, everybody knows about Heartbleed. And this was the first time we'd really seen, back in 2014, a vulnerability that had a website of its own and a nice pretty little logo of its own. And, you know, <laughs> I think, you know, if you think about all the coverage that Heartbleed got and how much it still gets today, um, you know, we're just past the two-year anniversary of Heartbleed, but you still see it referenced as one of the biggest vulnerabilities in history. Um, yes, I'm not undermining that it was not a serious threat, but if you just look at the marketing tactics around it, again, another head-scratcher. And you, it's interesting, it goes way back. You can look at, um, was it three, four years ago, um, right at the time of RSA, McAfee talked about Shady Rat, and it got lots of attention, um, and the next year they came back with something called Night Dragon, which was really nothing in the, in the end, but it was time to, to go out with RSA. Um, if you look at the, the 60 Minutes report that was done on Conficker, um, if you ever get a chance, go back and, and watch it again. The only person that talks in that entire segment is, is the researcher from Symantec. Um, it, it, reporters can be duped, especially on uh, very technical uh, new vulnerabilities. They don't know, they, they don't, they're not very good filters. And so um, when you see stuff in the news, particularly in the mainstream news, like the Wall Street Journals and, and the New York Times and, and those sorts of things, where the reporters don't sort of eat, sleep, and breathe security. Um, watch what you see because, and and you know, give it some thought as you know, read read everything you can, and because the problem is, and we'll talk about this some more, is you know, your executives coming saying, you know, I saw this on the Wall Street Journal, it was on the front page today, 
you know, what are we doing about it? And when in fact, it's, it's not something that, that's really going to affect you. And it's mostly because a reporter got sucked in somewhere where they shouldn't have. I do have to say the names that they come up with are pretty darn creative. <laughs> the Melissa virus, I love you, this dates me, but hey, been around a while. So what's this tornado effect of crazy headlines causing? A lot of questions in our minds. Um, you know, do the security teams out there actually view these vulnerabilities as real or serious? Does it confuse them even more? I'd say yes, pretty confidently to that question. And are these threats being patched? And with marketing teams overhyping these zero-day threats and announcing them before a patch is actually available, are we actually allowing the cyber criminals and the malware authors a head start, giving them more time to actually exploit them? I'd say yes. And does it help or hurt a brand um, to put out reports, these you know, big, sexy reports? And is, are we seeing some of these security vendors out there losing brand credibility because there's too many of them? So yes, I'd say yes to a lot of these. It's causing a big headache in the industry. So I think what we want to do now is sort of take a step back and take a look inside the media landscape. I work with journalists like Tim every day. My team works with them. We've been working with these guys for a long time. We know what they're up against and how pressure-filled the environment is to cover news. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what Tim's life is like. And Tim, feel free to, <laughs> feel free to pipe in here, not to put words in your mouth, but Reporters are evaluated by how much audience they can drive. So they're looking for the big story. They need the headline grabber. That's what their editors want. They want lots of readers, lots of circulation. They need to basically hit numbers. They're looking for the stories that are going to interest the average person on the street or a business that everyone has heard of. And they're looking for breaking news, stories that have immediacy, something that just broke. You know, zero days are good for that. Um, you know, those new vulnerabilities we were talking about. And reporters are also driven by advertising. Um, the more content and pages they have, the more money they make. It's a simple equation. And they're looking to define a specific demographic that makes it seem more unique to the advertiser. And then they compete with each other for advertising dollars. So again, if you think about that, more stories, more dollars, more advertising, it all is important for journalism to maintain, you know, its sort of being and its existence today. Well, it's, it's, it's that, that sort of convolution of two different things. One, one, as a journalist, your goal is to, is to give you the most important information, the most useful information. Um, but uh, because we serve advertisers, I have to deliver, next month, I have to deliver a million page views. So you're looking at stories that you know lots and lots of people are going to write, uh, read, and that they're, um, and they're stories that are, and the sexier they are, the more people who are going to read them. So if I write, you know, a buffer overflow story, you know, and I get 137 hits, that's not helping. So, uh, but on the other hand, that might be the problem that you're dealing with today that, that um, is the most important. So it's sort of an extreme example, but we're, we're constantly in a, in, in a battle between, you know, what's most important to you, what's most useful to you, and what will get the biggest readership. And those are not always the same thing. Actually, true story. So about six or seven months ago, I pitched Tim and his team to meet with one of my former clients, which is a password manager company, and Tim told me that one of the only reasons why he was going to help, you know, have Sarah, one of his editors, take this meeting was because they had written a story in Dark Reading, I don't know, eight or ten years ago about top password managers. And he said it was one of the most widely read pieces. And so in my pitch, working with Tim and his team, he said, all right, let's do a follow-up story to this password manager piece because this actually will drive a lot of readers. If it did it before, hopefully it'll do it again. And so... Lucky for me, got the story, got the client in there, and it was great coverage, but product coverage isn't, isn't something that you guys ever do normally. But in the case of this, you made the exception just because that one story drove so many readers. Well, you know, it's the things that you look up in Google, right? You know, so you're looking for, you know, your company is thinking about uh, uh, 
buying a password manager, or thinking about a next generation firewall, or thinking about a WAF, or you know, those kinds of things. And so we want to have a story that kind of serves that. Uh, so, you know, 10 best WAFs, you know, 10 best password managers. Those are the stories that end up, you know, we have, uh, we did a story, geez, when I was at network computing 12 years ago or something like that, it was, it has a title like something like how to configure a firewall. And it's still one of the best stories that they get, that, that gets read on network computing. And it is, it's just, you know, really simple stuff. Um, you know, the, I guess the lesson you take away from that is be sure to check the date when you're, when you're Googling because some of this stuff is really old. <laughs> so another um, few important facts about journalists. Um, they're humans too. They've got a job to do and they are overwhelmed right now. Security news is moving at a lightning pace and the noise is also causing a lot of sort of stress on the journalists. They've got to crank out somewhere between three to five, you know, to eight stories a day. And this definitely causes them to have less time to go do really in-depth research and call a bunch of sources and sort of verify the pieces that they're putting out there. It's just really kind of the nature of the reporting industry these days. I'd say 10 years ago, not the case. You would see maybe a, one story a day from a journalist and, you know, they'd go home, have a nice dinner and go to bed. These guys are up all night. I'm seeing stuff at 2, 3 a.m., stories breaking on weekends. It is a round-the-clock job these days. And then they're looking for the low-hanging fruit. So they want these, like, quick-hit stories that you can package up and give to them where, you know, you give them a press release, give them a threat report. Sometimes they don't even do interviews because they just don't have time. So they write them quickly. What they love? Breaches, compromises. Um, we see a ton of breaches. In fact, I think there's a ton of breach fatigue out there in the market because we're seeing at least one to two, maybe three big breaches a day in the news. Um, but these are still what the readers want and what, you know, is going to drive that circulation. And they like stories that cause fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Anything that's going to cause anxiety or, you know, be eye-opening for the reader, that's obviously going to be a huge one to gain more readers. And they like news exclusives. And we've seen a lot of this in the past few years. And as a PR person who has pitched news exclusives, I know how important it is for a journalist to get maybe a first on a story. We see folks like Brian Krebs, who gets a first on a story, and then everyone else has to write. And it's sort of a, a game of cat and mouse. They've got to catch up to write the story that just broke. But that's sort of that cycle that they're in. Someone breaks it, and it's a catch-up game. You know, two hours later, we see 250 stories on the same vulnerability that Brian just broke. But it's, it's just the nature of how it is. If Brian writes about it, it's probably accurate, credible. It's a story that everyone else needs to cover. And what reporters don't love are breaches with little impact. They don't like product news. I told you that before. And right now, they are not having a good time with the oversaturation of threat reports. I think... You know, even just in the last year, year and a half, it's become more difficult for my team to go out there with new vulnerabilities and threat reports and actually get them covered because I think reporters are finally looking at these with raised eyebrows and wondering about that marketing hype versus reality. And I think reporters are dealing with the same thing that you're dealing with. I don't know how you actually have a job while you're trying to process all of the things that you have to process. But, you know, for, for us, we're seeing, you know, there are 1,400 and some security vendors out there, and, you know, 90% of them are hitting my email box, you know, every day. <laughs> you, yeah. you know, asking for coverage, telling us about something they're doing, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I don't know how you begin to process that as a security professional, whether or not you, you want to use that product, whether or not it's something you should be thinking about using. Um, and the threat reports are the same sort of thing. We're, we're constantly filtering. We're constantly trying to figure out what's important. And, um, you know, the trick is, um, you know, there are good reporters and there are bad reporters. There are some that are, that are good at, at choosing the right stories to write. Some are not. Um, some are new at it and they just and they just pick up whatever's thrown at them first or whatever Krebs was writing that week or whatever. Um, so, you know, 
it, just as you decide who you're going to follow um, uh, on Twitter, you know, among security experts and that sort of thing, it's a good idea to kind of watch reporters, watch writers, watch people, watch publications that you think are especially good because some of them are good and some of them aren't. And the other thing too is there are journalists out there that are freelancers. They're writing for two or three or four different publications and they are paid by article. That is how they're making a living. So they have to feed the family. So naturally they're going to try to crank out six, seven, eight stories a day and they're not going to have time to, you know, validate and do a ton of research. Like I said, it's just, you know, it's definitely a, a very different environment with journalists and, and media than it was 10 years ago, and the noise factors in. So what else influences the news? Well, vendors and PR. So Tim knows that if he needs a security expert, he can call me because I represent 12 different security clients, and I can connect him with someone that knows something about, you know, forensics and incidents response, or, you know, a breach or vulnerability. Um, a lot of times the reporters will go to people that they have their own direct line to, people that they've been talking to for years, people like Graham Cluley or Bruce Schneier. They know that they can make a direct phone call, ask them a quick question, get a quick quote, file the story, and it's done. Um, Twitter, we've already talked about that. A lot of the news starts on Twitter. You know, that first story that breaks from, you know, Dark Reading or from Vice or the Wall Street Journal, you see it first on Twitter, you see the retweets, you wake up in the morning and, you know, again, 200 stories have been written, but a lot of it starts right there at Twitter. And that's where some of the reporters are actually looking at who's tweeting and who's commenting to figure out who to actually interview um, to pull into the Rolodex uh, to get them in the story. And it does create this sort of wave effect, and we see it every day. Influential Twitter tweeters also carry a lot more weight, and it's people that, you know, are constantly on the Twitter sphere, they're, they're up on the up and up about these news stories, and they're, again, notable subject matter experts. And then other media. So, like I said, you know, Wall Street Journal breaks it, basically that wave continues, somebody else has to write it, and then you see a plethora of stories. And then search engines. This plays a big role. So, Google and Google News are huge drivers of traffic. And um, publications, they definitely write stories that are optimized for, you know, those channels. When you go to Google News and you put in, you know, Heartbleed, you want to be the first one up at the top of the rankings, right? First story, first click. Right. And, you, and of course, you all know that you can buy that spot. You know, so you, you really need to, you know, as you're doing your Google search or even just in the day's news, be aware, be aware that what you see at the top of the list may not be the best story, may not be the most valuable stuff, it may be somebody who just bought that spot. Okay. And just a quick look inside marketing and PR, which is what I do for a living. <laughs> so we have one goal for our clients, and you know, marketing teams have this too. We need to drive sales leads. And we have a, a lot of ways we can get there to do it, a lot of tactics. Um, you know, analyst relations and public relations is just one tiny piece of it. We have search engine optimization, we do email marketing campaigns, we come up with unique messaging, we do brand building exercises with our clients. We come up with that really unique story that we build this huge campaign around, and then we go when we build infographics, threat reports, um, videos, all of that factors in. But at the heart of it, you know, marketing and PR people, we're held to very strict measurements. We have KPIs that we have to meet. As an agency, we guarantee our clients a certain number of opportunities per month based upon the retainers that they pay us. And those numbers feed into the marketing person at, you know, the vendor. So it's very important to note that a lot of the things that you see, these marketing, um, you know, campaigns and these stories that are out there, a lot of this is, again, you know, a marketing person behind the scenes, it's got to keep his job. They have, you know, strict measures and they have to drive sales. And then, I mean, and, and PR organizations are just like publications. There are good ones and there are bad ones. You know, I mean, there's a handful of people like Michelle who actually understand security, who can help me work with the story and actually make something out of it. Um, and then there's the other 80% of people who call me up and say, are you working on a security story today? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's, and you would be amazed at how many, you know, 
organizations that get paid tens of thousands of dollars to hire 22-year-old people and call me up and say, hey, do you cover security? You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really bad. So it's all part of that filtering process, you know, figuring out what's important and what isn't. There are good, good sources and bad. And we have to be really creative. Um, with this crowded, noisy market, we have to figure out very unique ways to get, you know, a marketing or, you know, PR campaign out there. So it's looking at, you know, maybe a former White House executive that we can pitch to a journalist. We can definitely use someone with a great bio. Um, it's finding that great piece of research. It's, you know, finding the breaking news story to fit a client into. We've got to figure out ways to do it um, that are, you know, going to make our client stand out and really drive the ink. Because again, we've got these KPIs we've got to meet. And we also have to be credible and honest. And at the heart of it, every PR and marketing person has to know when to say when and when it is a little too bogus or too over the top. And we have to be the filter sometimes to say, you know what, this isn't going to work. And there are times that it's hard. You have to shut clients down and say, nope, this is just not going to be the story that we're going to get into. It's not the right time. I mean, when we've seen national you know, crisis, you know, hurricane reliefs and American Red Cross getting hacked, you know, we have to make decisions to tell our clients, that's not a story you want to be in. We're not going to be ambulance chasers. You know, we have to do the right thing. Um, but again, at the end of the day, it is about spin because that's our job. And, and you know, it's, it's tough because vendors eat a lot of their own dog food, right? You know, so I, I don't know how many people I, you know, talk to and they come in and they have, do an interview and, and they say, we're the only ones doing this. You know, and, and I'm sitting there going, I can tell you six other vendors who do the exact same thing. And, but they've been living in this little world where they know what they know and they, have, they think they've developed some sort of concept that's brand new. And so, you know, for both of us, we're, we're constantly in a state of, of, in some cases, telling people what the reality is. <laughs> that we are. Um, so I just saw the 15-minute timer, so we're going to probably run through a few of these pretty quickly. Um, just to make sure we get some time for wrap-up and Q&A. So why do some stories get so big? Well, big numbers. Um, if you look at the OPM hack a year ago, I mean, everybody had to write about it. It continues to drive a lot of attention. Other major breaches, you know, Anthem, Blue Cross, those are the stories that are going to drive readers. The big names, well-known companies. You know, you look at the breach <laughs> at MySpace a couple days ago, and I kind of laughed. I'm like, God, I haven't used that in, I don't know, a decade? <laughs> I don't even know my username or password. Good Lord. But you saw at least 400 stories on MySpace being hacked. Um, big claims, you know, the industry first, most dangerous vulnerabilities, Heartbleed, Drown, those are the stories that we see a lot of coverage on. And then anything dealing with the adversary, you know, the unusual threat actor, anything that sort of goes back to attribution. We've seen a lot of that the past few years. Yes, that information is good, it's interesting, um, but at the end of the day, if you're at an SMB and you're managing you know, IT and security, and you're wearing all these multiple hats, do you really care about this threat actor in Russia? You're more worried about, you know, trying to figure out how to, to make sure antivirus is working. So, um, again, all of these things sort of feed into this overall noise in the market. Yeah, they, they happen in waves, you know. It starts with a, something that happened on Twitter or a vulnerability that's announced, and it sort of expands out like a stone dropped in the water, um, and, you, and you see you know, coverage from the, the trade pubs and then the mainstream pubs will pick it up and then people are tweeting about it and um, it, it's, it, you know, stories get big because they start out in just the right place at the right time where, you know, other times uh, a story might get drowned out. I remember uh, eBay had a, had a hack a couple of years ago, well into the millions. And it, but it happened at the same time as a bunch of other things that were happening. And eBay was very, very, they handled it very well. They didn't say anything. They didn't talk about it. Nobody else did either. And it didn't end up getting a whole lot of coverage. So, you know, it's, it can be timing. There are a lot of things that, that factor into, you know, what you see in the headlines. So what's the disconnect? Well, so here we're talking a little bit about just news in general. So your local news, they have to decide what they're going to pick. They have 22 minutes to give you your half an hour program. Um, and they only have so many slots. You know, me, I only have so many reporters. So you have to decide, you know, 
are you going to present the story that's most useful? Um, let's say the IRS um, changes tax codes and, and uh, everybody's going to be affected. Everybody, it's, it's going to cost you more money uh, in your taxes this year. Um, or Kim Kardashian you know, breaks up with whoever she's dating or whatever. Um, the IRS story is more impactful. It's, it's a story that, that's, good, that's gonna have a material impact on your life, but it's IRS tax codes. It's boring, you know, it's not sexy. You know, Kim Kardashian and you, know, you can show pictures and you know, that kind of thing. So new, anybody who does news, whether it's me or your local news, they're gonna have to make a decision Am I gonna run the most informative story, the most useful story, or am I gonna run the sexiest story that's gonna get me the most audience? And so keep that in mind as you're looking for, uh, what, what you're, as you're looking at what you're reading. You know, you get the, the big ATM machine that's dishing out cash, you know, that's one of those things where it's like, you know, wow, that's a great story, but most of you are not managing ATMs. So that's not, not as useful to you. So, you know, one of the things we try to do at Dark Reading is we try not to get the, too focused on the shiny objects. We try to do more stories that are useful to you, but, you know, we're just as subject as everybody else. You know, sometimes, you know, that drone story is really cool or the, you know, the car hacking story or, you know, that kind of thing. So just keep that in mind as you're coming along. Some of the things that are happening may not be in the news just because, you know, other stories got chosen. So here we're talking a little bit about, um, and, and we already, you know, we, we talked through a little bit about where the, the information comes from, but the point that I'm really making here is that, you know, media is just one source for you guys. So you have on, you know, you're sitting in the middle, and at the top is our top level executives, and they're reading stuff too. They're reading Wall Street Journal, they're reading you know, whatever, and, they, and so they see stuff, it's security related, what are we doing about this? So you got that push. Then you have users who are finding out, you know, about, uh, who are reading mainstream media too, or they're um, hearing about things that are happening, phishing attacks and things like that. So they're kind of pushing up from underneath. You have the sort of security community that's telling you about, you know, this is critical. You know, Microsoft is saying, you know, this new vulnerability is critical. Zero day. Uh, this is, uh, you hear from researchers, you know, it's got a big name on it, you know, it must be important. So you got this push, you know, and then you have the, the vendors um, and the, the folks who are talking to you about um, the, the technology that you already have, um, you know, whether it's SAP or Oracle or, you know, those, those folks are saying, you know, we've discovered this vulnerability, you need to patch. So you've got this, so, and you're sitting in the middle and you're getting all these inputs from all these places, and you're the filter. You have to decide, you know, today, these are the most important things that the security department has to deal with. You know, and it may, it may be that that boring old patch that has nothing to do with anything that happened in the media today is the most important thing on your, on your list. Um, you have to decide that, and it's not gonna be the same for every company. That's the other thing that drives me crazy about being a journalist, is that I'm sort of spewing news, and, but you know, for some of you, it may not be that important. You know, if, you have, if it's a new Linux threat and you don't have any Linux, then you don't care, you know, even though it might be right there on page one or you know, right there at the top of the site. Um, you, you have to filter out what's useful to you. You kinda have to create that that sieve that says, you know, I'm only gonna care about this. And even though this is interesting and I'll read about it when I have a break, um, I'm not gonna use it to make a decision about what I'm doing in the security uh, department today. So, and again, you know, this is, uh, you know, just a, a reminder that the media doesn't know your environment. So that, you know, they're, they're putting out stuff um, and they're trying to get as much, you know, traction as they can in terms of traffic. But um, they don't, they're, they're not gonna know, uh, you know, uh, SAP is a great example. So if you're, you know, financial services or lots of other businesses, 
live, breathe, sleep SAP. Your whole business is SAP. But in, in terms of readership, there are only so many people who have SAP. There are only so many people who are interested in reading about SAP. So there may not be that much news there. You know? so, um, whereas a Windows threat is going to go all across the web because everybody has Windows. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about it. You know, it'll, it depends on what you have and what your, what your priorities are in terms of where your data is um, as to what that, that little news story about a new vulnerability in SAP, which didn't appear in a very many publications, might actually be the most critical thing that day for you to look at. So some tips and recommendations just to wrap up here for you guys. Yeah, I mean, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, how uh, corporate executives and people, uh, you know, they see stuff. They, you know, it's on 60 Minutes. It's on, it's in the Wall Street Journal. That, you know, it's, it's sort of fed to, to them, and they don't know security. So you have to be willing to push back and say, you know what, that story's not important to us. We, we, you know, we, we got it handled. Don't worry about it. Um, you know, in, in other cases, it might be something that you want to have an answer to, you know, when your boss says, you know, I saw this today, you know, is this something that we're working on? Yes, we're working on it, but it's, it's fifth on the priority list because of X, Y, and Z. You know, so you factor the media in, but it's, it's not driving anything. Um, I, I, the analogy I use is um, in, in financial services, when you talk to brokers or people who, who deal with uh, uh, investing, they generally have their own specialty. They're, you know, they, you know, their their thing is pork bellies, and they only want to hear about pork bellies. And so, even though there's tons and tons of financial news every day, and they have decisions they have to make on a minute by minute basis, they have a filter that says only show me the news about pork bellies. And that's the kind of thing that that you need to do. You figure out where your your most critical data is what it's residing on, what the, what, the tech, what the applications are that are running it. And that's how you read your news. And anything that doesn't fit that, you know, put it aside for reading at lunch or you know, whenever you have time. You, know, you want to stay up with stuff as a security pro so you can have conversations of, like at conferences like this. But you know, the things that are important to you, as, you know, from a, on a daily basis may be something completely different. So what do you do if your organization is actually a victim of a breach? You need to have a breach response and crisis communications plan in place. So there are a lot of companies out there that do tabletop exercises that will bring in all of the executives into a room, all of the stakeholders that need to be part of this to actually practice. You'll role play. You'll prepare for the inevitable because hopefully none of us will be breached, but we know the day may come. So you need to be prepared from both a corporate communications and PR perspective to you know, communicating with your stakeholders. One company that actually did this really well, and I think it's probably been about five or six years now, was Bit9. So Bit9 is a security company that actually got breached. And you know, when the news broke, of course it was you know, a ton of headlines, but what was great about what they did is they were very transparent. They wrote about four or five blog posts disclosing what they knew at what point in time they knew it, and they were very honest. And I think that's the, the one thing, you know, if, if I'm a shareholder in Bit9, or you know, I'm a partner or a customer, I want honesty, but I want communication. I want to know what's happening. Um, but when it comes to the media, you have to be careful about what you say. So of course the media were calling Bit9 that day. They wanted to know what happened, tell us the details. But at that moment that that breach happened, when they first figured it out, they didn't have all the details. So the advice of you know, the PR and communications team is you know, be honest, but again, you know, if you don't have details, then don't go outright and say you know, stuff that's not true or something that you can't back up. So I thought it was really interesting that they over-communicated, but it actually, in the end, didn't really hurt their brand as much as a normal breach would. You can also turn breach news into a positive. So if you think about Heartland, which was, God, I don't know, 2006 maybe? Um, that CEO took that huge breach and basically went out there and started talking about it and said, here are the lessons learned from what we went through and what we experienced. So you can take something that's negative and turn it into a positive sometimes. 
And then I think you just need to think about all of the aspects of the potential impact. You know, if you are breached, you have to think about the investors, the brand damage. You have to think about the loss of trust and loss of credibility. You need to really think about all of these things before it actually happens and make sure that you do employ and do these tabletop exercises because that in the end will help in that moment where it hits and you're scrambling and you're trying to figure out what to do. So what are the key takeaways? I think you guys know. <laughs> All right, I just got the, uh, the wrap up in a nice, very uh, nice sign there. I'm not gonna repeat that since my boss is in the room. Um, <laughs> I think you guys get it. Security news isn't created objectively. Um, you know, there are a lot of factors. And use the news to your advantage, but don't let it set your agenda. Remember what your day job is. Okay.